The beginning of the recollection of the priestess Hathor Hath, servant of the goddess Hathor. Once it came to pass while I was keeping vigil within her temple, in the beginning of the month of her name, while the fertile inundation of the Nile rose towards the temple, that Hathor, our bovine goddess of the purity and strength of love and motherhood, mother of Horus, daughter of Ra, mother of the pharaohs, lady of the sycamore, mistress of the sky and turquoise, that she wept. Salty tears and saliva dripped down her cheeks and lips. She shifted her feet, bent over, and planted her hands on the ground. They transformed into hooves. Linen fell from her back to the floor. She stamped on the cloth like one threshing grain. Hathor's golden image transmuted into a breathing cow. The carvings of her on the temple walls wailed and lamented the whole of the night. In the dark, holiest center of the temple where she had once stood resplendent yet hidden, I cupped her chin in my palm. Tears collected around her eyes. She cried a soft and desperate low through her open mouth. Frustrated breaths warmed my hand. I kept vigil over her through the night, gently stroking the mother of mothers like my babe, as she had comforted and nuzzled so many. She occasionally stirred and cried out in her sleep. In the morning, Hathor awoke in her temple. She stood with groans and began to amble. She turned her head to the left and saw a pile of severed cow core legs and heads on an offering table amongst cakes and flowers. She laid her head upon the offering table and wept, filling its indentations with her tears. She snorted and gritted her damp eyes as she reared away from things. The smells of charred flesh and incense lingered in the air from the burnt offerings. We exited the temple. Her hooves pounded in dirt upon the stone floors. Though it was morning, the day was still as night. None could see their own nor our shadows, for they saw darkness by day. The priestesses, priests, and others were afraid and surprised to see the one who shines as gold. They were used to yoked cows goaded and whipped by their custodians. And they had seen Hathor's statue floated up the Nile to visit Horus at Edfu, but they had never seen something like this. We continued outside the temple to its cow fence. Here were cows held by the temple and its elites. These were rented out for the temple's profit to be worked on lands owned and taxed by the temple itself. Some from this herd were hobbled and sacrificed, offered to the goddess herself, as well as to other deities, including the pharaoh. They mooed when they heard us, eager for breakfast. Hathor kicked down the fences and stood among her brethren. She moved, she moved back to them, and they gathered around. She licked their faces, and they licked hers, all rubbed their great heads together. Now Hathor raised her eyes, and in a moment there issued a ray from within the circle above her head. This ray sent forth light in the darkness which surrounded her. It extended over all the regions of Upper and Lower Egypt, so that every field and desert appeared wholly illuminated by its radiance. We saw the various animals and birds and fish and plants in those states become visible, and we saw whether they were in a happy, unhappy, low, eminent, or intermediate position. We saw in many fields the servants of Hathor and other gods whipping cows and sheep. The working humans themselves were whipped as they plowed and carried heavy loads. We saw in many marshes fowlers grasping birds by their necks. We saw chariot horses impaled by spears and arrows in battle, riding alongside and piled upon the mass of human and not human bodies. These spears and arrows were hafted with animal skin. The feathers were fleshed from birds' bodies and fired with a wooden antler bow. The very skin shields that protected the fighters were taken from the cows. We saw donkeys, cows, and humans forced march to bring supplies. Many like them were captured and died on their way to Egypt as spoils of war. We saw the daughters and sons of the Pharaoh's body attending to Hathor's golden images, while snorting and screaming cows cried out, had their leg tendons cut, were tripped, and fell heavily to the ground, being hobbled, wrestled, and stabbed. We saw the blood flowed from their necks and illuminate the fields and the temple floors. We saw tongues hanging out and eyes rolling back as the killing and dying finished. 
We saw musicians and priestesses of Hathor playing harps drum with the sinew of cow's guts and beating drums covered in skin. They clapped ivory clackers ripped from the faces of elephants. Priests wrapped themselves in the skin of leopards. We saw dripping newborn calves tied away from their wide-eyed lunging mothers whose milk would be taken. Their wretched cries were incessant, so they were beaten, suffering pain on pain. So it is for the poor wet nurse who must expose her child in the desert to feed the babes of the rich. This is what power looks like, and like this the royals and nobles depict themselves killing more animals in their tombs. And even in the heavenly field of reeds they continue flogging, killing, and eating more animals after their earthly deaths. The rich have pleasant lives and afterlives, the poor and animals have neither. Though we and even the gods strain to look at her amidst the degradation of creatures, the flowers and plants across all of Egypt slowly turn towards her overflowing emanation. The baboons also turn towards her and raise their palms toward the rays sent forth above her head. I then said unto her majesty, Speak, O most eminent of goddesses. In this assembly there are thousands of beings trustful, affectionate, and respectful towards you. They will understand the words you expect. Hathor spoke. You say that I am your goddess of the purest mother we love. I have shown you the child as attacker, the sibling as enemy, humans murdering their mother, stealing, torturing, and murdering her children. Truly, all the animals, their hearts weep. What are these things which have come to pass? At the very time that I am uttering syllables, being our, beings are oppressed with evils. How long shall I cry that you will not hear? I cry out to you of violence that you will not save. You herd cows around your temples only to kill and profit by them. Their legs are hobbled so you can wrestle them to the ground and snare before my image. Their throats and nostrils are stopped up, destroyed. You offer their heads and forelegs to the gods. Our castrated sons are goaded to carry your bodies to your tomb before being slaughtered and laid alongside you. Isis goes before your coffin. Her sister Nephthys follows behind you. They grieve for you, but who wails for these cows trotting westward to their unjustified slaughters? And you send horses and goats to these foreigners. Why do you do this? They do not want to walk to Cardunius. Like the Marianu families of human chariot warriors, are the children of the bodies of Egyptian horses at the head of the Hittite cavalry, and those of the bodies of theirs at the head of yours when you battle? Do your archers kill your own horses? In your temples, you show images of horses and oxen and mules and cows and battle and war trains. Look into the eyes of these images and think of their pains, not your own riches and glories. How did you become powerful, grow, and protect your strength? With your herds of animals and subjugated humans, ever in debt to farm crops that go to your temples on rented lands with rented draft animals. Your subjugation of human and non-human beings is the root of your power and the strength and reach of your mace. You fear that your women are treated or described as animals. You know how savagely you treat us, and you cruelly break and dominate human women. But during childbirth, who stands beside the wounded ones among you? And yet you forcibly impregnate me with your fists and arms shoved in my two rear openings. You steal my babies and their milk. You kill my sons and call their bodies veal. You force my daughters to repeat my fate and then kill and eat them. You force feed the goose and the cow. The smell of our burning bodies appetizes you. You walk on skin sandals and wrap yourselves in our remains when you are cold. You know that these are an abomination and remove them outside the temples. You paint your eyes with eyeliner made of animal fat. You hunt us for entertainment and think it shows you as strong and powerful. It would be much stronger for you to disagree with your brethren who engage in such amateur butchery and recreational violence. For many thousands of years in the past, slaughter of animals and cruelty to living creatures has increased. What began as natural hunting of creature living upon creature has been perfected to an abomination by your administrators. Now we live in confinement. Look at you how you have killed the free roaming cows and replaced them with subjugated forcibly impregnated, castrated, desecrated cows who you control more profitably. You were forced to do this by the elites who dominated your ancestors and theirs. They control the land, the animals, and the humans themselves, and exploit you all for their own status. Throw off your yoke and those of your fellow beings. If you look at me as the symbol of motherly love, do not steal, maim, and kill my children. We beg of you. 
Finally, another of the priestesses said, Give us a word, Mother, that we may prevent this. Hathor steadied herself and spoke these wise instructions. Give your ears and hear what is said. Give your mind over to interpretation. It is profitable to put these words in your heart, but woe to one that neglects them. Let them rest in the shrine of your insights, that they may act as a lock in your heart. Do not despise a matter that pertains to a cow. There is to be no divine or human savior, and the gods have become ineffective in protecting the animals. In the midst of a community able to command a profusion of delicious foods, it ought to be deemed an affront to set dead flesh and mother's milk before a guest. Do not unjustly eat what the water has given up, and do not desire as food the flesh of slaughtered animals or the milk of mothers who intended as pure drought for their young. And do not grieve the unsuspecting birds by taking their eggs and killing their sons, for injustice is the worst of crimes. And spare the honey which the bees get at times by their industry from the flowers of fragrant plants. For they did not store it that it might belong to others, nor did they gather it for bounty and gifts. The motive of all must be love before we can make life worth living. Do not expect utopia during a lifetime, not within thousands of years. And even if it arises, will it not need sustaining and protection? No, but struggle for kindness in your time. Keep the fight for those present. Be inspired by those who called out for justice before you. Don't let their love have been in vain. There will be setbacks in your time that will be worse or longer lasting without your resistance. Secure your strongholds where they now stand. Change conventions near to you. Engage the temples, their priests and teachers, and the people in other causes directly. Every step gained gives a better position for future advance. Have sympathy and fight for the excluded, non-human and human alike. Do not pity the laborer while oppressing the cow. The righteous care for the needs of the animals, the lands, and the waters, but the kindest acts of the wicked and the cruel. Instill your love into the entire world. The gift of affection is worth more than the provisions that cover your back. Speak justice, do justice, for it is powerful, far-reaching, and it endures. There can never be an excess of high standards, nor should there ever be a mean act to reach the humblest inhabitant of the universe. Do whatever imposes injustice to any creature. Try, so far as you can, to wrong no creature, and keep your heart pure towards all of them. Either live in kindness or lay down and die by starvation to feed the land, insects, and scavengers. Humans came after the cows and other beings who will outlast them. My brethren, the time is no more when we control our fates. It is up to the humans now. They have subjugated us. It is up to them how much and how long we suffer. I cannot protect you. If the gods had wanted to create a world where the humans did us no harm, they would have. Eventually, the humans will destroy themselves or learn to abide all beings. But someday, the lowing herds will graze freely on what remains. We are abandoned. We must persist. I know that many of you will confidently try to prove that you have reasons for regarding your position as legitimate, legitimate and quite indispensable. You will say in your defense that authority is given by the Pharaoh, the temples, and the gods that the functions of the state are indispensable for the welfare of humanity. But however much you try to deceive yourselves and others, you all know that what you are doing is opposed to all the beliefs which they profess. And in the depths of your ba, when you are left alone with your heart, you are ashamed and miserable at the recollection of it, especially now that the baseness of your action has been pointed out to you. Not a person at the present day can fail to know that all these actions are base and disgraceful, and that you need not do them. You all know it. You know that what you are doing is wrong and would not do it for anything in the world if you had the power of resisting the forces which shut your eyes to the criminality of these actions and impel you to commit them. Hopper thought. In their ignorance, they will not need the instructions I announce. She braced herself and again birthed the sun Ra in his beetle form in Kepuru for Newt to carry across the sky. She knew that without daylight, the beings could not live. The beacon raised for a new first dawn. By the light in the dark, 
Copper inspects the progress around the world. She looks upon the creatures in their shadows. Every day she hopes to see improvements and grieves with those who continue to suffer. And in her dreams, Hathor sees the horrors. And in her sleep, she still weeps. And she is apart from her brethren, yet she still raises the sun. Let this be a lesson for a million generations of people. Let this recollection be a statue for Seshat and Hathor. Remember the lament of Hathor, and let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Be kind to all beings, for this is the whole duty of us all. Thus ends the lament of Hathor.